All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me get the lights and whatnot fixed up. I'm going to get the sign-in sheet passed around. Um, I've had a couple questions about the first homework assignment, so I thought I would clear something up um, so that you all were, were adequately prepared. So I want to look at problem two. So problem two, you've got this bar system, which is the one that, uh, the problem that I think you all are probably going to spend the most time on. Um, a number of you have, have started to, to work on this, and there's a, a, a couple errors that, I, that I'm seeing right off the bat, so I want to um, clear some things up. Uh, the first thing to, to point out is, okay, there are a total of six elements, okay? That does not mean that this stiffness matrix will be seven by seven, okay? The reason that was the case for the last problem was because all of the elements were connected in series. You know, there's one, you know, one connected to two, two connected to three, so on and so forth. That's not the case with this. The elements are sort of all over the place. So how do you determine how big your system matrix is? It's a function of how many joints you have, how many nodes you have in the system. So how many joints are there in this model? Five. Okay. These rectangles, one, two, three, four, five, those are the joints. Those are the bodies that will displace. Okay. What will prevent those bodies from displacing? These springs. Okay. So the springs are your elements. Okay. So does that make sense? Okay. So I picked an element uh, just um, well, off the top of my head, like K2, okay? I noticed a lot of you were starting your uh, solution out something like this. You were saying, okay, K2, that's the second element, so it's got to go 2 to 3 and 2 to 3. And then your system matrix, well, there's six elements, so they're 7 by 7, and it's got to go like that. That's wrong, okay? So let me explain. Okay, so first off, do you all agree that the whole matrix should be 5 by 5 because there are five bodies that, will, that could potentially displace? One, two, three, four, and five. And one and five are the ones that are restrained. So those are the ones that you will eliminate for your boundary conditions. Okay? Everybody all right with that? Now, joint number two, okay, or, or not sorry, joint number two, element number two. Sorry about that. Element number two. Okay? Element number two has this stiffness of one. So the matrix will be one minus one minus one one. Okay? What joints is element number two connected to. So we're looking at this spring. What is it connected to? Two and four. Okay. So here's what, okay, so what my point is, is this is the incorrect way of assessing it. This is the correct way of assessing it. So if we're looking at spring number two, it is connected to joint two and joint four. So when I look at my system stiffness matrix, I put those values where they go. Okay. So your values, they don't have to populate a nice, neat block. They can be all over the place, okay? And that, let me say this. This is an odd system. I, I understand that, and that's the purpose of this problem is for you to understand that, that process of assembly. But one system that isn't very odd, that this happens to quite a bit, is a truss, okay? Because what does a truss look like? There are members going all over the place. That's what a truss is. So this type of thing happens quite frequently with trusses. So I wanted you all to be aware of how this works. Okay? Is everybody all right with this? Does anybody have any questions? Okay. So um, what I want to do today, though, for my main sort of topic is I want to talk about trusses. Now, I say that this is part one of matrix stiffness analysis because, in my opinion, this is... I guess what I would call a real application uh, of matrix analysis and of finite elements. Because this bar analysis stuff, I'm not saying it's not important, it is, but um, you're not really building very many spring systems like that. You know? So I understand there's some uh, uh, conceptual concepts there that, and not too much direct application. But trusses we build all the time. Okay? This is a real system that we see in, in place all over. So. Um, Everybody sign in? Okay, all right. So now what I want to do is I, I want to spend some time talking about truss analysis. And, and by and large, truss analysis and beam ana or truss analysis and bar analysis are, uh, well, they are the same thing um, with one little caveat. Right. Well, everybody's here, so I can take that. Okay. Um, What's easy about bar element or about truss elements? Um, well, there's a number of things. Um, 
on a grand scale, the, uh, uh, the load vector is, is simple. Now, that might, that might seem like an odd observation right now, but that won't be so odd later on when we talk about beams. See, the difference between doing like a bar analysis and doing something like a beam analysis is that when we did our previous uh, example with, with the bar elements and whatnot, we had loads applied directly at the joints, right? I mean, our problem here, I'll go back a little bit. Here was our problem, and our loads were applied directly at the joint. So it was simple. We just, we needed a load vector. We just looked at it. We said, hey, here it is, okay? That's simple now. That's not going to be the case for something like a, 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 a beam. Um, that might not make a whole lot of sense now, but it will later. But if, if you think about it, you can kind of say, well, for beam elements, you know, what's a typical beam problem? Maybe something like a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, right? Well, I mean, those loads are not applied directly to the joint, so that makes that a little more complicated. We'll get to that. Trusses, on the other hand, though, they're, they're really easy in that regard because the loads are applied directly to the joints. Um, another point to mention, which isn't on this slide, but one of the nice things about trusses is that the mechanics are very simple. In other words, we've already figured out the mechanics. You have a bar, you yank on it, its deflection is PL over AE. That doesn't change if we're talking about bars or trusses, it's all the same. Okay? What's tricky is uh, orientations. The fact that with trusses, we have members oriented all over the place. Okay? So we have to develop a means of coordinate transformation. Okay? Everybody all right with that? Okay. So let me sort of explain what I mean by coordinate transformation. Let's start off with this. Is everybody all right with that? Our, our fundamental stiffness matrix for a bar element. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, now, let's, let's just uh, make sure that we understand this a little more in depth. Um, how many degrees of freedom have we identified at each joint or at each node? Let's see if we remember that. How many degrees of freedom at each node? Just one, right? We have horizontal displacement here, horizontal displacement there. So the element in total has two degrees of freedom, okay? So if the element has two degrees of freedom, the stiffness matrix is ultimately two by two. Everybody okay with that? Okay? Now that's nice if everything is along one axis, but that's not the case. I mean, trusses have members all over the place. They're going left to right, they're going up and down, what have you, right? And trusses are triangular structures in nature. So, so because of that, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to say, wait a minute, now we have to incorporate another dimension. We have to say that each one of these joints could translate horizontally as well as vertically. Right? Okay, so now what I, I ask, let's, let's ask this a little more in depthly. How many degrees of freedom do we now have at each joint? Two. So if I look at the stiffness matrix for a truss element, how big should it be? Four by four, okay? Everybody good? Okay, now, here's the thing. This is still a truss element. This is still a bar element. The mechanics are still the same. When you're dealing with a bar element, and you probably remember this if you uh, go back to when you took structural analysis or mechanics and materials or whatever. When you're looking at axial force members, you make an assumption. And that assumption is that axial force members are subjected to axial forces, and that's it. No shears, no moments, no twisting, none of that. Okay? Just axial loads. So if you look at that on the flip side and you say, well, how does that member respond, you, you have to make the same assumption. And by, what I mean by that is when I look at truss elements, I say the only way that that member resists loads, the only stiffness I get from that element is from values along its axial direction. Okay, so if you look at this stiffness matrix, I have here, I propose to you that this is the stiffness matrix for a truss element. And notice how the only values that populate this stiffness matrix are associated with 1 and 3. Why 1 and 3? Because 1 and 3 are the only ones that act along the axis of the member. Right? Everybody okay with that? Okay. 
So everywhere else, I say that this member does not resist load in those directions. Therefore, it has no stiffness in those directions. And I get zeros everywhere else. So far, so good. Good. OK. Now, here's the problem. Truss elements are oriented all over the place. You have truss elements going like this, going like that, going like this. They change. So what we have to do is we have to be able to account for those in some fashion. I just realized I never gave you all this handout. Whoops. Okay. All right. So what I want to do is, is I want to introduce to you um, a, a different type of terminology. Now, this is going to be a, a, a foreign terminology to you until you start to, uh, you know, grasp it. And I think afterwards you'll see. Oh, okay, this will be fine. Yes. Um, well, I was going to ask. Are you are you registered? What's that? Uh, well, yeah. Well, I, I only printed off the ones that I thought were going to be here. I'll get you one later. Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so I, I, I understand that this might be a little bit of a, a different terminology for you now. It'll make a little more sense when we get into it. One point I will make is that this whole local and global um, coordinate system right now um, might seem, I guess I should say, um, appropriate only for trusses. But this will actually become important later on when we start using real finite element uh, software. Because any time that we build a full three-dimensional model, in some way, shape, or form, we need to relate everything to a common coordinate system. So this is actually part of a larger topic that will affect everything we do in this class. But the point I want to make is that um, in order to handle this members being oriented at, at different orientations or what have you, we're going to define two different coordinate systems. A local one, which will be solely for an individual element, and a global one, which will be for our entire problem. Everybody good? So for, for notation standpoint, I say that our local coordinate system, which we'll say is this x prime axis and this y prime axis, are along a given, an individual element. Make sense? Okay. The, uh, the x-axis and the y-axis, though, the ones you know, down here and down here, might be indicative of the entire problem. Everybody okay with that? Okay. So how do we relate the two? Okay. Well, when we start thinking locally and globally, we have, um, well, how, how should I put this? We kind of have to think that way across the board. When you think local and global coordinates, it stands to reason that, that I mean, what, what's the whole purpose of this? You know, you're, you're trying to calculate member displacements and member forces and things like that, right? So it stands to reason that if I've got local and global coordinates, I've got local and global displacements. I've got local and global forces, right? So ultimately, we're going to try and figure out what's the difference between a local and a global stiffness matrix. And once we figure that, we've kind of nailed everything down. Um, but what I want to do is propose to you the following definition, that we are going to develop a new type of matrix. I'm going to call it a rotation matrix. If you um, start uh, delving into the literature, you might find some people call it a transformation matrix. You might even hear some people call it a mapping matrix or, or what have you. But in the end, I propose to you that there is a relationship that we can define between local displacements and global displacements and we call that a rotation matrix. That's what I call it. I call it rotation matrices. Okay. Now, what goes into a rotation matrix, I think you can probably figure that out. Okay. So, <coughs> let's, let, me, let me propose to you what would populate those matrices by looking at this. Okay. So, what I have here is an element, and I have this displacement, delta 1, which is acting along the, uh, the element of interest. Okay? Now, I have here a positive uh, angle of rotation theta. Right? Now, you all know enough about trig to know that I should be able to 
break up that uh, displacement into an X component and a Y component, right? And I could say it's the X component times the cosine of that angle and then the Y component times the sine of that angle. Y'all are aware of that, right? Okay. So that's one thing to point out. This might seem uh, uh, like I just sort of wrote this, but I really also want you to pay attention to the signs. What direction is U1 going? To the right. What direction is U2 going? Up. They're positive, right? Make sense? That's the point I wanted to make, okay? So that would be a, 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 tra a, a, a translation, if you will, between local displacements and global displacements if all I'm talking about is this one. Okay, so that's delta 1. What if I'm talking about delta 2? Now, it might look here like I've got my arrows written backwards. And maybe I should pull up a little notebook or whatever to try and draw this out. Maybe a little clearer. So if I have, let's say, an element, you know, going something like this, right? And then Oh, nope. Got the notation wrong. That's delta 2. That can be split into components that look something like this. Fair statement? But my point that I want to make is that this displacement, that's negative. This displacement here, that's positive. Okay? So what I have here on this slide is I have the displacements drawn in their positive directions, going to the right and going upward. I'm just saying that that one has to be negative just because of the mechanics of the situation, right? Make sense? So I can do one for delta 1, delta 2. Theoretically, I could do the same thing for delta 3 and delta 4, and I'd get, I mean, it'd be the same deal, right? It'd just, you know, it's the same thing over and over again. I don't have, have it on the slides. I could if I wanted. But my point is, is that I could develop these similar equations. You all Believe me when I have this. Y'all believe that? Now, would you also agree that if I've got a bunch of equations like this, I mean, this whole class is about matrices, would you agree that I could take these equations and write them in this format? Okay? Because think, what do I have? Let's look at the, the top row, right? Remember, you go along this way and down there. I have U1 times cosine plus U2 times the sine plus 0 plus 0. That's that first equation, right? What about this one? Negative u1 times the sine, u2 times the cosine, so on and so forth. Do you all see that? So see how I have a relationship between local displacements and global displacements, and that relationship is this 4x4 four four matrix here? That is my rotation matrix, this. It makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, we're talking about rotating stuff between one angle to another. It's filled with a bunch of sines and cosines. That should make sense, right? So far, so good? All right. Okay. Now, this is something I mentioned, I think, on day one. Uh, we started talking about just matrix algebra in general, and we mentioned things about, you know, are matrices symmetric? Are they invertible? And I mentioned that there are some matrices that exhibit a really odd property called orthogonality. And orthogonality means that a matrices transpose and its inverse are the same thing. And that's really odd until you look at a matrix uh, like this. Because I want you to think about this. Okay? If I took this matrix and transposed it, what would it look like? I would just be changing the, the signs of these and changing the uh, signs of these, right? Now, imagine if I took those two matrices, this and then it's transposed, and multiplied them. What ends up happening is along the main diagonal, you get sine squared plus the cosine squared. And what is the sine squared plus the cosine squared? One. Okay? That's what you get along the main diagonal. Everywhere else, you're either going to get zeros or you're going to get sine cosine minus sine cosine. Well, what's that going to be? Zero. So one's along the main diagonal, zeros everywhere else. What do you get? The identity matrix, right? So that de defines that a... Uh, a rotation matrix is orthogonal. And that actually makes our lives a whole lot easier when we start looking at how do we determine a stiffness matrix. Okay? 
Now, how does that work? Let's go here, okay? Let's recall. This beta matrix relates global to local, okay? So if I have global displacements, multiply them times this rotation matrix, I get local, right? Same thing's true of forces. If I take local forces, <laughs> multi or if I take global forces, multiply them times a the rotation matrix, I get local forces. Make sense? Okay. So what I want to define for you is the difference between a local stiffness matrix and a global stiffness matrix. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so this is going to be my, my notation. I'm going to say that the Ke prime is local because that's how the axes were. Prime was local. And I'm going to say that global uh, stiffness matrix is just the K. Okay, everybody all right with that? Okay, there's a lot of stuff on this slide, so we're going to take it one step at a time. Okay, because I really want to digest what's going on on this slide. Okay, so to start off, okay, I want you to see what we got going on on the very first line, okay? Very first line says local forces equals local stiffness matrix times local displacements, right? We already have the local stiffness matrix, right? The local stiffness matrix is that, okay? We already have that, okay? Local stiffness matrix, local forces, local displacements. Everybody good? So watch this. Okay. Local force, local stiffness, local displacement. What is a local force vector? It is a global force vector that has been rotated. Does everybody see that? What is a local displacement vector? It is a global displacement vector that has been rotated. So you see how I went from the first line to the second line? Everybody good. Now, what I want to do is multiply both sides by this. I want to recognize that this is the same as that, right? Because that's how you get the, uh, the, the, that, that's the property of orthogonality. Everybody good? So, look here. On the left side, I have beta times F. Now I have beta transpose times beta times F, right? There we go. Yeah, you see where we're going with this. Okay, on the right. K prime beta U. Now I have beta transpose K prime beta U. Everybody see that? Okay. What happens here? Beta transpose times beta. They cancel. Well, they don't really cancel, but you, if you take beta transpose times beta, you get the identity matrix. And the identity matrix times F is going to be that. Okay. Now, let's think about what's going on right here. Okay. What did we have up here? We had local forces equals local stiffness times local displacement. Now, what about right here? Global forces equals a pile of junk times global displacements. What is this pile of junk? That's my global stiffness matrix. Does everybody see that? Everybody okay with that? Now, I want to show you something because I'm, I'm sneaky. This is your homework assignment. What's that last thing I asked you to do? Say, because uh, you're going to have to be able to do this. I mean, I'm sneaky sometimes. But I wanted you to be able to do this in Excel. Remember those nested calculations? I wanted you to be able to do that. Okay? Everybody okay with this? So far, so good? So, my point is, is that this is a local stiffness matrix. This is my rotation matrices on either side. I replace the cosines and the sines to just C's and S's to just uh, squinch the notation down a little bit. And if you go through and do all the multiplication, if you want a formula for it, you're more than welcome to have it. It's A over L times a bunch of sines and cosines. It doesn't really matter because we can do a lot of this matrix multiplication in Excel. But there, there's kind of some, some nifty uh, observations that you can make if you look at this and really try and digest it a little bit. Okay, what do I mean by that? Okay, we've been talking about, let me go back here, we've been talking about the difference between local coordinates and global coordinates. I, I propose to you the following question. What if 
they are oriented the same. Like, what if this is flat? Let, let's go through this exercise. What is theta if this is oriented in this fashion? What is theta? Zero. What is the cosine of zero? One. What's the sine of zero? Everybody all right with that? So look at, look at this. Okay. This is my local matrix, right? What's inside here? This is my global matrix. If that member was oriented like this, what would this value be? One. What would this one be? Zero, right? One, zero, one, zero, right? This would be minus one. This would be minus one. In fact, the only ones that would have values is here, 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 and here. Everything else is zero, right? And 80 over L times that, wouldn't that be this? Everybody see that? So what I'm proposing to you is that if the uh, coordinate systems are oriented in the same fashion, I propose to you that the local stiffness matrix and the global stiffness matrix will be the same. It's only when they get oriented that, that it changes. Everybody okay with that? All right. I want to walk you through a quick example on how this works. And, and I think you're going to find that there are a lot of... Um, a lot of similarities between this and what we did earlier, okay? This process is a tad more involved, but the spirit is still the same. Develop a stiffness matrix for each member, assemble it, apply boundary conditions, solve for displacements, break it back apart, solve for member forces, okay? Everybody all right with that? Now, let's see if y'all been paying attention. How big is the stiffness matrix for each member going to be? Each member, each element. It's not two by two, four by four. Because now when we look at trusses, we're saying that trusses can displace this way and this way. Make sense? So each element is going to have a four by four. How big is the whole system? Six by six, okay? Now, why'd you say that? What's that? There's three, no, exactly. There's one, two, three joints. Each joint can move left to right, up and down, right? So that means there's two possible movements at each joint. Three joints means there's a total of six joints for the whole, or six degrees of freedom for the whole problem. Six degrees of freedom means six values, uh, six by six stiffness matrix. Everybody all right with that? That's something I wanted you to make sure that you understand, okay? Everybody good? Now, one thing, I, there's a couple things I'll point out, okay? Notice how we have defined a coordinate system. I'm saying that my origin is here, okay? So now I can define X and Y coordinates for each of these joints. Everybody see that? Yeah, that's another thing to point out. Let me ask you a question. When I do my force vector and actually define my loads, what's this going to be? What am I going to put in my force vector right here? Is it, it going to be positive 10 or negative 10? Why is it negative 10? It's going down. Remember, consistent sign convention. Okay? Everybody good? All right. Let's take this one step at a time. Now, one of the things I've put here it is this, okay? Now, I really want you to pay attention to what I've got here. This is what I'm calling an analytical model. I actually, here was my original problem, and I actually, off to the side, said, okay, I'm going to draw this analytical model. Why is this important, okay? I am defining positive degrees of freedom at each joint. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Now, that's important for a number of reasons, the biggest being and I'll skip ahead a little bit. When I start doing stiffness matrices, I know what numbers to put here and here. Okay? That's important. Okay? Everybody good? So from here on out, like we'll define our analytical models for each of these problems, and that's what you'll go off of. Everybody good? Okay. Now, let's take a little bit of observation when it comes to this member. Okay? And you might want to put some, um, some 
some stars or whatever in your notes or, 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 or whatever, but this is kind of important. Okay? Let's take a look at element number one. Okay? Element number one has a cross-sectional area of one square inch. Okay? It has a length of 10 feet. Remember what we said at the very beginning. Okay? Units have to be consistent. So I don't care about 10 feet. I want 120 inches. Okay? E for this is this truss is made out of steel, so the E value is 29,000 KSI. Okay? So AE over L, plug and chug, and you'll get about 241.67. Or 241 two-thirds. Everybody good? Now, here's where we gotta pay attention. Okay? Let me go back a little bit. What did I say before about members being horizontal? This member is horizontal, so its local stiffness matrix and its global stiffness matrix better be the same, right? So let me ask you that another way. What must its rotation matrix be if that's going to be the case? It should be the identity, right? The multiplicative identity. One's along the main diagonal, zero's everywhere else. Okay. Now, I want to take a look at this bulleted list right here. This is something that actually screws students up quite a bit when they start doing these problems on their own. All of these calculations that I am performing right here, I am performing by taking higher node values minus lower node values. You might want to write that down if you haven't already done so. And I'll explain why here in a second. We're actually going to do this off to the side. Higher node values minus lower node values. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this picture and I'm going to go to my little notebook page here and I'm going to create a new page. I'm going to put that there. Maybe make it a little smaller. But we can actually work with it a little bit. Okay. Can everybody see this? Everybody see that? All right. Let's do a little bit of math here. Okay. All right. Everybody see the dimensions? I've got 5 feet and 10 feet. Everybody good? All right. What are the coordinates? Let's, let's keep this simple. What are the coordinates of this joint? X and Y coordinates. Zero, there we go. Zero comma zero. Everybody good? All right. What are the coordinates of this point? Oh, zero comma five. Maybe if we're using consistent units, it'd be zero comma sixty. Why am I saying sixty? Inch, there we go. So what are the coordinates of this point? There we go. Everybody see that? Okay, now, let's make a little summary here. So, element one. Okay. Element number one. What is the larger node number on element number one? Is it node number one or node number two? Node number two, right? That's the larger one, right? All of these calculations that you perform, you take the higher number node, minus the lower number node. Let me explain. Element number one. We have node number two, which is 120, comma 60, right? All right. Node number one, zero, comma 60, right? Everybody okay with that? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract these values, okay? So let's subtract them, and I'll call this like my delta point or whatever. Okay, what's 120 minus 0? 120. What's 60 minus 60? Well, oh, I'm sitting here writing 0. Okay, I propose to you that I'm going to call delta x 120, delta y 0. 
Is everybody okay with that? Higher number node minus the lower number node, okay? Let me say this. We could go the other way around, but the big thing is you've got to be consistent, okay? And going higher number node minus the lower number node keeps consistent with all of the sign conventions that we've already agreed upon this whole semester. Everybody good? Now, what we're looking at essentially is a triangle. Like what I'm getting at is I want to try and do this consistently. What we're looking at is a triangle that has you know, one leg that, that is this value and one leg that is this value. So if I want to look for, let's say, the hypotenuse of that triangle, or in other words, how long that member is, a systematic way of determining how long that member is might be the length is might be that, right? What if, now without a calculator, what's that going to be for this element? It's going to be 120, right? Right? Everybody with me on that? Why am I doing this? Why am I going through and doing this calculation? Okay? I'm all about efficiency when it comes to my math. Okay? Now, Let's draw this generically. Here's a triangle, okay? This triangle has a side delta y and a side delta x. And we just calculated L using the Pythagorean theorem, right? Now, would make sense that we want theta, right? Because we want theta to be able to calculate the sines and the cosines, right? So Let's walk through this. Here's one of two ways of doing it. Could we calculate theta by saying, I don't know, the inverse tangent of that divided by that? But then once we get that angle, calculate the sine and cosine of that angle? That's one way of doing it. Here's another way of doing it. Y'all remember that, right? Bringing it back. We are bringing it back. So my point is, okay, my point is, from the coordinates of this element, I've got delta x, delta y, and l, right? I propose to you that the cosine of that angle is simply delta x over l. Sakatoa, adjacent over hypotenuse, right? What is delta x over l for this angle? Right? Opposite over hypotenuse. Y'all see that? Bringing it back, aren't we? Sakatoa. There's no point in, like, calculating an angle and then using that angle to determine sines and cosines. You've got all the necessary dimensions that you need to calculate them directly. There's no point in doing more math than you need to. Okay? So, if, if you want, let's say here are the two big notes that you need to take. Like if I had to put a big star on this. Okay? Number one, higher node minus lower node. Two just use Sakatoa to calculate your your relationships. Everybody okay with that? All right. Let me go back to the slideshow and explain why that's important. Okay? Okay. So here's, let's go back to the original problem, okay? So we got here, we went through, and this is element number one. So for element number one, my delta x is 120, my delta y is zero. So that's how I'm calculating sines and cosines, right? Everybody all right with that? So I propose to you that if this is my rotation matrix, plugging in sines and cosines, this is my local stiffness matrix, 
this is global and it just so happens to be the identity matrix because the member is horizontal this transpose times that times this will give you that everybody okay with that we'll go through that matrix math next time okay everybody all right with that like how to do it in excel because it's just a nested multiplication all right now here's element number two this is where it gets complicated okay you all have the diagrams in front of you right so the area is two square inches okay I propose to you that you're going from higher number node to lower number node so your dimensions matter okay Does everybody see that going from two to three we have to maintain our consistent signs okay that's why I have negatives here does everybody see that because going from two to th whoop, I'm going the wrong way going from two to three like I have an X coordinate here and an X coordinate there if I take that minus this I'm gonna get a negative answer take this minus that I'm gonna get a negative answer do you, do you all see that see how I'm getting the negatives that right there the 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 negatives and the positives I'm telling you that's what gets the students every time and if you always go higher node minus lower node you'll always be fine Everybody good element two okay so going from joint two to joint three here I have Delta X and Delta Y so I can compute the length of that member pretty easily, just Pythagorean theorem, right? Pythagorean theorem gives me about 134.36 inches, right? So A times E over that gives me that for my stiffness. Everybody okay with that? And then, again, rotation. Cosine is delta X divided by that, so I get a negative cosine, right? Negative sine. And it's not as pretty now. It's 0.447 and 0.894. Okay, so my point is this: for that inclined member, okay, for that inclined member, the the A or the local stiffness matrix is nice and pretty. Zeros everywhere, and just a value here, value there, value here, value there. Right? That's for the local matrix. The global one, there are values all over the place in the in the global matrix. Why? Because now I've got values populated in this rotation matrix. Make sense? So it's all over the place. Now, another thing to point out. Look at these codes. See that? Three, four, five, six. See that? Because those are the, mem the, the member codes associated with that member. We're looking at element two. Three, four, five, six. See that? So, what happens is this. Okay. Whoop. What happens is this. This first element, one, two, three, four, those values go right here. Three, four, five, six, those values go right here. Any um, members that coincide, you add them up. Same deal, right? But we had that extra step in. We had to, do, we had to rotate our, our member. That's what that member rotation is all about. Okay. Everybody good? But again, it's the same spirit. Develop a stiffness matrix, assemble. Okay. Everybody good with this? We need to apply boundary conditions. Now, let's talk a little bit about that. Here's my, well, here's my stiffness matrix. This is a hinge, right? Let's go back to statics. What does a hinge mean? A hinge withstands movement in the x direction and the y direction. If we only wanted to restrict movement in one direction, I wouldn't have put a hinge there. I would have put a roller there. Y'all remember that? So rollers would only restrict movement in one direction. Like, for instance, if this was a roller right here facing that way, then I wouldn't have crossed out that one. See what I mean? My point is, is that because it's a hinge, I'm crossing out one, two, five, and six. Okay? You all see that? I'm crossing out the ones associated with where it can't move. Very good. So crossing out one, two, five, and six, I'm left with this little chunk. That's my reduced stiffness matrix. Reduced stiffness matrix, I have a force vector that I can develop pretty easily. What do I have? 
3 and 4, 0 and negative 10. Why is it negative? Okay, that's easy. Why did I put it on the bottom value? Why didn't I put it on the top? It all goes back to this. Vertical direction was associated with 4. The load was applied downward. So it was on 4. Okay. Does everybody see that? This is, I mean, a lot of this is all about matching, you know, making sure that everything matches in your analysis. So if you have this and you have that, with what we did last time, you should be able to calculate this, right? Just the inverse of that times that. You can do that in Excel already. We did that last time. So it's no more complicated. Everybody good? Now, when we got to this point, what did we do? We took the displacements and we then broke them apart, right? into displacement vectors for each element, right? Remember that? So here's a global displacement vector. Would you agree these are going to be global displacement vectors for each element? 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 5, 6. So far so good? I can get local displacement vectors by just multiplying each of these times the rotation matrices, right? So this is the conversion. By taking this, multiplying, I go from global to local, right? Now watch this. Global displacements now turn to local displacements. Local displacements, I have local stiffnesses. Now I can get local forces. Look at these local force vectors. Isn't that the same thing we saw before? Two values equal and opposite, right? Remember that? Based on that, it, it's, it's the same deal. If I look at this one, it's kind of like looking at the same thing. Like look at element number one. That first value being negative means it's going to the left. This value going to the right, it's like it's in tension, right? This one going to the right. This one going to the left. Forces like that, compression, okay? Now, my little trick for that is I just look at this number, and if it's positive, it's in tension. If it's negative, it's in compression. That, that's my way of doing it. That's why I have these cells highlighted. Just my little shortcut. Instead of having to do all the diagrams in my head, I can just look at it and see. Everybody good? The last thing that I have to do, I can take the whole stiffness matrix, my whole displacement vector for the whole thing, and calculate this. What is that? This is the force vector for the whole system. Now, these two central values, what do these represent? Those are the loads that were applied at the very beginning, right? Number four is negative 10, right? Because there was a negative 10 load pointing downward, right? Remember that? Okay. What about these yellow values? What are those yellow values? Those are the support reactions. So on joint one, I have a 20 kip reaction acting to the what direction? The left, right? Zero acting up or down. This is 20 to the right. And that's going up, right? Look at this, th this for a little bit. If I look at every odd value, those are the values in the x direction, right? What if I add up all the odd values? What do I get? If I add this, this, and this, what do I get? Zero. What about the even values? What do I get if I add this, this, and this? Sum of forces in the x direction must be Sum of forces in the y direction must be zero as well. So if I summarize my analysis, what did I find? The reactions, I've got all the reactions summarized. I've got the fact that the internal member forces, member one was in tension, member two was in compression. I've got my joint displacements. This problem is really no more involved than the one we did before. What made it complicated and what made it a little tricky was the bookkeeping combined with the fact that we had rotation matrices. But in the end, the problem is the same. Okay. What do you think? Not too bad, right? This really isn't that bad. I, I, at least I think right now this should be pretty straightforward. I'd argue conceptually beams are a little more challenging, but when we do beam analysis, it's actually simpler because there's no rotation. Beams, we always just assume, are horizontal, so there's no rotation involved. It's the non-nodal forces that get complicated with beams. All right, you tell me. What do you think? Any questions? All right. How are we feeling with the homework? Any, any questions on that? Everybody good? All right. Well, I'll tell you what. That's actually all I had for today. I'm going to end it a little early. Um, you all be safe.
getting home, although the snow isn't too bad today, but tomorrow it's going to be, we're going to be hit pretty bad, I think. So y'all uh, try and stay off the roads if you can. Um, stay muddled up, stay try, try and stay warm, and I will see you all next week. Am I good? All right.